Thank you very much for this kind introduction. And first, I'd like to thank the two organizers of this uh, series of lectures, uh, Professor Marin, Professor Ochimoto, and asking me to join this, this lecture group was very important for me. So my name is Gail Sebald. I, we can start. Yes, thank you. And actually, I'm more working on, in applied physics. And today, we'll focus on electromagnetic methods for non intuitive testing. And I might, I might add a couple of physics behind uh, time to time. So to introduce electromagnetic methods, it is important for me to recall, more generally speaking, what is NDT, non destructive testing, to situate those techniques compared to other NDT techniques. So yesterday, you had some general introduction about NDT and focus on ultrasonic testing. And uh, also, you had degradation mechanisms of materials. So this is my own introduction about NDT. It is the fact that a damaged material is unable to tell itself, contrary to human beings who can tell when they have pain, but materials cannot do that. So you need to ask to the material in some ways. So asking to a material how it is, you need to uh, send uh, either light, sound, electromagnetic waves, contact liquids, etc. And by reading or by analyzing the response of the material, you can assess the presence or not of flows or the status of the material and system. So this testing can be done in some cases non-destructive when you want to reuse the parts that you, that you tested. And you can make it also sometimes in situ for a structural health monitoring. So the definition uh, that I found on the course NDE.org, it is a, the use of non-invasive techniques to determine the integrity of a material, component, or structure, or quantitatively measure some characteristic of an object. In this series of lectures, um, uh, the focus is more on maintenance, but actually NDT is heavily used for um, inline product control. For example, when you, want, you may want to inspect raw products made from uh, forgings, castings, extrusions, etc. Et so meaning that in the factory you will add some control uh, lines and you will test the material in all the process of the fabrication from the raw products and then inspection following, secondary processing, like after some machining, welding, grinding, heat treating, plating, etc. Each step may induce undesired uh, states of the material or defects. So you will not wait to complete your fabrication process to test it. You will test it at each step of the fabrication. But of course, NDT is also used for a maintenance or in-service damage inspection like to detect cracking, corrosion. Yesterday, you had nice explanations about the different types of corrosion and the difficulty to detect them, uh, erosion wear, heat damage, etc. Uh, one very important application of a, a testing, and especially eddy current testing, it is for the power plant inspection, when a periodically power plants are shut down for inspection. And this example shows some eddy current uh, signals uh, used to check corrosion damage on the heat exchanger tubes. Another very important uh, application of NDT, it is for a jet engine uh, inspection. And aircraft engines are overhauled after being serviced for a period of time, like uh, 10,000 hours or something. And actually, this maintenance uh, represents 10 to 20% of the direct operating costs in aeronautics. And the engine maintenance is 40% of this amount. So very important. The, 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 I had the chance to visit a, a, a factory making this maintenance. And the engine are left for one hour, completely dismounted, cleaned. And a, each part is tested individually. And they use all possible NDT techniques for the various parts inside. Another example that I like to show, it is very, very uh, old NDT for rails. Actually, if you go back to 100 years ago, there were already uh, test uh, trains to check the integrity of the rails. 
And the difficulty that uh, we are having here is that you need to do it fast and you have huge length to be tested and you cannot uh, stop the trains for a long period of time. So you need to get at night some trains of control who will test uh, various things to avoid this kind of effect. Um, another uh, application, it's a bridge inspection. Um, nowadays bridges are something like 70 years old worldwide, most of them. And we may have problems in the cables or in the concrete. And inspection of bridges are important. And some uh, recent application is to use uh, acoustic emission sensors to listen for the cracks, the sound of cracks, to detect that we may have a problem of, or not. So this was for the couple of examples of the application of NDT. Now we present the different, some of the techniques to situate what is electromagnetic NDT. So these are the various techniques that exist. Not all of them are normalized, meaning for a, some techniques, no standard exists, but for some other techniques, for example, uh, visual testing, ultrasonic, liquid penetrant, eddy current. Uh, in red, there exist standards. Uh, to use it. Some of us are more at the research level. So the very first uh, NDT technique, and maybe the most important one, it is uh, the visual inspection. So it's not highly technical in terms of equipment, but it is in terms of interpretation. Um, in factories, when the operator ends some machining, he will check visually if the part is okay or not. And um, when the defects or the flaws that you want to detect are, are too small, you, you may use uh, fibroscopes, borescopes, and so on, or magnifying glasses or mirrors just to enlarge the view and detect, for example, cracks. When the parts are of large sizes or not accessible, you may use a robotic rollers uh, to go in the system and to provide you an image through a camera. So this technique, it's uh, very simple and effective in terms of equipment, but requires from the operator a very important training to be able to know how to analyze the images of things. So, but sometimes the cracks to be detected are too small to be detected by visual inspection. So there exists a set of techniques able to, de to, to, to detect small cracks. So one, which is a heavily used, it's a penetrant testing. And it consists of a using um, a penetrant liquid that you, 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 that you put at the surface of the material to be tested. You wait for a given of period of time that the a, a liquid a penetrates the cracks. Then you have to clean the surface. So you will remove the liquid from all surface except the crack because it would take time. And then you can use uh, some specific light to reveal by fluorescent uh, properties the cracks of different parts. This is highly effective and the one big advantage it is that you obtain a full image of the surface of the material. And this is where we will, we, we, we will have differences between NDT techniques. Sometimes you will have local inspection. You know the integrity of the, mat of the structure at one point and some other techniques you can have a full image and you can control an area of the material at once. This is a case of penetrant testing. This was the case of the visual testing. You have an image of a given area. So uh, usually this technique, you can uh, detect cracks uh, uh, in the millimeter to centimeter range. And this graph shows the probability of detection of a crack depending on its size. And this is the average of the positive or negative test uh, results and you have a more than a 90% detection from 0.5 inch, so from 1.2 millimeter, uh, centimeter. Um, <clears throat> apart from this technique, um, there is a very similar one when the material is phelomagnetic. When it is phelomagnetic, you can play with the magnetic properties. If you take a given part made of steel, typically, you can magnetize it by external magnets or coils, and then you can use magnetic particles covered by a layer that is fluorescent, and the particles will get attracted by the um, 
the magnetic field gradients, and when you have a crack at the surface of a given part, uh, the magnetic field lines will tend to, 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 to have some leakage outside, and the particle will get attracted there. And then, by some uh, appropriate light, you can reveal the different cracks like on this picture. Uh, a variation of this technique is to remove the particles because it is easy to get them attracted to the crack, but then to remove it, it's difficult, and you need to clean up the part after inspection. So um, some newer techniques uh, don't use magnetic particles, but use magnetic sensors able to scan the surface and like a squid and like a giant magnetic resistance sensors and so on. But it's based on... All, all of them on the fact that the magnetic field tends to, to, to have some leakage nearby the cracks. And the <clears throat> one last technique to detect uh, cracks and also uh, not only surface defects but also defects in the bulk is to use a radiography. Um, I will not spend much time on it, I think that all knows how it works. Um, I would just say that one difficulty it is the a distance uh, of penetration of the X-ray, which is highly limited for metals. So you can, expect, you can inspect a, only thin materials or those that are not made of metals. And some recent uh, research application is to use in a very similar type uh, X-ray images, but after rotation of the material and by some a, calculation, you can find back 3D images by analyzing the shadow of the part on, under various orientation. Uh, it is not NDT, just material a characterization. <clears throat> so this completes this very first introduction remarks. Uh, a variety of techniques and application exists. Um, innovation is still possible, of course, otherwise we not have researchers working on that. Um, for in Innovation can help for a better safety. Uh, 3D imaging using X-ray enhance the possibility to inspect large volumes of materials, but always the end user knowledge about the application is of primary importance. <clears throat> so now for the next hour, I will focus now on the electromagnetic techniques. So, the first thing, um, eddy current testing, it's basically to use a coil, you place it nearby the surface to be inspected, and you analyze the impedance of the coil. There exist plenty of configuration, but all of them are based on coils and the analysis of the electrical signals in it. Contrary to all techniques I presented before, eddy current testing is a local measurement. So you may think uh, you are losing uh, the capability to see a large area of material to be inspected. So why are we using this? Just because it works very, very fine, and in some applications, you know where typically the defects would appear. So you can analyze locally by eddy current testing. So eddy current, um, it's uh, electrical currents that are induced by magnetic uh, time variations. So you need to apply an alternative current uh, to a coil and to measure its voltage and to deduce the impedance. And the signals will depend on the medium nearby the coil, more, pre more precisely its magnetic permeability and electrical conductivity. Both those properties would uh, modify uh, the impedance of the coil. So if you take uh, this representation here with only one loop coil, you have a primary magnetic flux that is generated by the coil. This magnetic flux uh, enters the material under test, and because it is harmonic excitation, you will have induced eddy current in, in the material, and this induced eddy current would will generate a secondary magnetic flux that, get, uh, that will go through the primary current coil, and this will induce voltage differences. So you are really asking to the material to respond to time variations of a magnetic field, 
and you will uh, listen for the response in, with the same coil that is generating the excitation. Let's go back to some more fundamental physics, simple one. Um, let's have a look to the uh, electromagnetic wave equation for the electric field. So the uh, second order space derivative of the electric field is linked with the second uh, order time derivative of the electric field and the first uh, order time derivative. So the left part, it's usually what we consider when we consider only propagation of waves. But when you have a non-zero conductivity, you will have an additional term, the first order time derivative. Depending on the uh, ratio between the coefficients mu epsilon and mu sigma, you will have a weak attenuation or strong attenuation of waves. Um, yesterday, you had an example about attenuation for acoustic waves. You may have similar things with this kind of, uh, with electromagnetic waves as well. But it happens that in case of metallic materials in harmonic regime, you can rewrite the time derivative by multiplying the function by g omega. And if you look at those two terms here, you will have mu, the magnetic probability. You will have epsilon, the electric permittivity and not permeability, and sigma, the electrical conductivity. And it happens that in all metals, the conductivity is really high compared to epsilon omega. So if you look at these two terms here, if the sigma is much higher than epsilon omega, we will be able to neglect the term in the left. And what remains, it's simply a second order space derivative linked to the first order time derivative. It is not anymore a propagation equation. It becomes to be a diffusion equation. So the solution is of different type. When you do this, um, oh yes, here an example for copper with the typical conductivity of copper, permeability and permittivity. Uh, this condition, how to neglect uh, the second order time derivative compared to the first order time derivative, you would need a frequency much less than 10 to the 17 hertz, which is almost the X-ray, right? So we, you will never have the case of propagation of waves in metals. So a diffusion equation would have a very different category of solution. So one example of solution is of that kind. Uh, it's an attempt to write it just like a propagating wave. So we write an amplitude easel of the electric field, exponential j omega t minus kx. And the electric field would be a given a norm, uh, direction n. And the wave number k of what represents uh, a, um, a kind of wave number, if you inject this solution in the diffusion equation, you will notice that the wave number k has to be a complex number, which means that it will be written like 1 minus j over delta. And if you inject back this solution inside uh, the electric field expression here, you can put outside of the exponential term that one which becomes to be real and you have an electric field that will consist of one thing that looks like a propagation and an attenuation with space. So for example here if you put um, a coil nearby a copper plate or a block of copper um, and if you look at the expression of the electric field, uh, you have such kind of variation of electric field. So this is a electric field amplitude versus space and plot against uh, at various time of the period. And the important thing is to notice that the um, amplitude is decreasing with space quite rapidly and a completely linked with the wavelength or the apparent wavelength. It's not a propagation, but meaning that one or period, it's enough to completely damp the signal. And whatever the frequency you will test, you will always have the same damping. It is independent on the frequency because you are solving not a propagation equation, but a diffusion equation. Now, what does it mean for NDT or eddy current testing? It is that the amplitude will 
uh, get attenuated quickly in the material, and this is uh, examples of the attenuation of the electric field versus space in micrometer for low carbon steel, high carbon steel, a copper, aluminum, a zinc, and the typical range. Uh, so this is, I guess, for one megahertz. The typical uh, penetration depth of the AD current will be in the hundreds of micrometers. Um, this is, uh, or you, but you may change also the, the frequency, get to higher frequency to lower frequency depending on your objectives of detection, and you can uh, adjust it uh, to various uh, penetration depth, but still uh, in the uh, sub-millimeter range. So this is the first half of the explanation about the origin, or when, how works the AD current testing, how to generate currents in the material under test. But now to understand what is happening on the coil, you need to notice that the voltage of the coil is uh, related to the magnetic flux density time for variations uh, in the coil. So, if you take a coil, you have a self-inductance, the magnetic flux generated by the coil, is inducing electric field on the coil itself. So basically, you can write that the voltage of the coil is linked to the time variation of the magnetic field, or the magnetic flux density, and you may rewrite it as an inductance term L in Henry multiplied by the time derivative of the current. In the vicinity of a magnetic material or a conductive material, the value of the inductance is modified as well as the resistance of a, the coil. Um, a conductive material is subjected to eddy currents. As a consequence, eddy currents will generate a magnetic field in the coil. And this will counteract the primary magnetic field generated by the coil itself. So when you have eddy current, the magnetic field in the coil will be reduced. And if it is reduced, you have less magnetic flux in the coil so the inductance will decrease. But also, if you have a decurrent in a material whose electrical conductivity is not infinite, the current means a electrical losses. So conductivity multiplied by the electric field squared, it's a volume uh, electrical losses in the material. So if, we, if you have losses, you need to have an image of the losses in the impedance of the coil. Practically, it will happen that the resistance of the coil will tend to increase. So as a summary, if you put a coil nearby a conductive material, electrically conductive material, the impedance of the coil consisting of a resistance and an inductance, the inductance would decrease the resistance would increase. And this is exactly what we want to measure to be able to detect variations of the apparent conductivity of the material under test. But actually, the variations are very small. Um, if you compare the impedance of the coil in air and you put it nearby a conductive material, you have a huge variation of the impedance. That's easy. But if you want to detect defects, cracks typically, the variations of the impedance will be very, very small, less than a few percent. So to be able to analyze the data, there are some techniques of writing of the impedance that may help to interpret the signals. <clears throat> so the impedance of the coil will be written uh, R0, a resistance, plus G omega L0, an inductance. To analyze the signals and to be able to um, interpret the effects of cracks on the surface. You may write that the material under test acting as a new source of magnetic field. If you have two mediums, two coils in interaction, it looks like uh, um, a mutual inductance problem. So that can be written like a transformer, electrical transformer. So you have on the left side R0 and L0, which are the electrical properties of the coil. So the sensor coil. And on the right side, 
L1, and this is an impedance with a real part and an imaginary part of the impedance. This will represent, roughly speaking, the electrical behavior of the material under test. And both are linked by a coupling K. And this coupling represents uh, the capability of uh, the coil to induce things in the material under test, and the opposite, the um, electrical quantities induced in the material under test may uh, interact with the impedance of the coil to this coupling. When the uh, eddy current probe is far from the material under test, K will be zero, and it will increase with a maximum of one in the perfect case, but we are always very far from one. It will increase when you will put the sensor in contact with a with the material under test. This very first analysis showed that the distance between the coil and the material under test will play a really big role in this signal. And this is what we call the lift off distance. So the control of the lift off is really important. <clears throat> so then how to how to analyze what will happen when we will have defects? We we consider uh, the impedance uh, with this schematic here, with a couple of calculations, you end up with this expression for the impedance of the coil when it is placed in the vicinity of the material under test. You find back on the left side um, the impedance of the coil in air, R0 plus G L L0 omega, and a term which is linked to the coupling K and the properties of the material under test, uh, RE and IN. Um, so believe me that this equation is true. Um, but written like this is not very uh, easy to analyze, so there is a way to do it. It is to calculate some reduced impedance. So we consider the uh, impedance of the coil in air Z0 equals to R0 plus JX0, and we consider the impedance of the coil in contact with the material under test ZC equal to RC plus JXC. And we calculate a, re a normalized or reduced resistance by making RC minus R0 divided by the imaginary part of the impedance of the coil in air. And we do a similar calculation for the imaginary part of the coil, XCN equals to the imaginary part in contact with the material divided by the imaginary part of the impedance of the coil in air. It may look a bit artificial, but that's a way to normalize uh, the behavior of the coil in contact with the material or to suppress the impedance in air. So you may directly uh, subtract to RC and to XC the impedance of the air, but it will not be as efficient as doing it like this with this division. And when you have written that, it's possible to uh, calculate it from uh, this, uh, this expression. So you may calculate the real part of the impedance ZC and the imaginary part, and both the real part and the imaginary part, so RC and XC, will depend on the properties of the material under test and the coupling. And by a couple of calculations, you may end up with this expression. So this reduced resistance of the coil and reduced imaginary part of the impedance of the coil may be written like uh, a circle equation. It means on the left side, you have something that looks like x squared. Here, it will look like y squared in equals to a constant. And this is the equation of a circle, which means in this expression here, um, K, uh, IM, and RE, in some cases, may be independent on the frequency. If you do that, of course, the impedance of the coil, RCN and XCN, depend on the frequency. Obviously, it's an inductance, so the imaginary part should increase uh, with the frequency. But if written like this, the terms nearby sometimes are independent on the frequency. So if you change, if you increase the frequency of the signal and you analyze impedance in this way, you will find out that the impedance, uh, the reduced imaginary part plotted against the reduced real part of the impedance will align along a circle here. And the circle depends on the coupling. So if you take uh, a, a poor coupling, so k close to zero, the circle will be very small, it will be very close to one. And if k equal to zero, you will be at this point one, which is by definition 
uh, the uh, impedance of the coil in air. Now, if you have a better coupling, you will move down on this graph here. So usually for endocrine testing, it may be interesting to vary the frequency to reveal more precisely the defect that you want to, to detect. So this is fine for the impedance of the coil in air, the impedance of the coil in contact with the metal under test, but now we have to consider the effect of a defect, of a crack on this. When you will have a crack, so this represents again the imaginary part, the reduced imaginary part of the impedance plotted against the uh, reduced real part of the impedance of the coil. These are the circle just presented before, and those points here are the center of the circles, which uh, may be plotted by minus IM on real part of the material under test properties. And <clears throat> imagine that you start from point P0, your coil, your probe is in the air, and you put in contact with the material under test, you will move more or less like this green dotted curve until you reach the point of the circle at a given frequency. Now you will move your probe on the surface of the material under test, and you may eventually reach a point where you have a crack. If you have a crack, you will not detect it like for an image, but you will have it is that the electrical conductivity looks like to be smaller. On average, on all the eddy currents induced in the material, some part of those eddy currents suffer from broken lines, so the average conductivity is decreased. If you decrease the conductivity, it is just like you will move back a little bit on the circle in this way. But at the same time, um, <clears throat> At the same time, you will have a, the crack because the distance between the probe and the material locally is a bit higher. It looks like the liftoff or the distance between the coil and the material under test is slightly increased. So when you will have a crack under the probe, you will have two effects. The uh, real part of the normalized resistance uh, impedance will be slightly decreased and the imaginary part will be slightly increased. So you will somehow try to go back to the point in the air. So those variations are really, really small. And to detect it, you will have to use some normalization or, so, or, or to subtract the impedance of the coil when you are in contact with the material to just reveal what is happening on the surface. So as a technique, uh, you consider here the um, eddy current test probe nearby the test piece. You will connect it to an impedance bridge, a Robertstone bridge that you will power by an oscillator. You may want to modify the frequency if needed. And the signals on, on the branch of measurement of the impedance, you will uh, filter it, amplify it, and demodulate it with the uh, oscillating frequency to obtain uh, the amplitude of the real part of the impedance and the amplitude of the imaginary part of the impedance, and so you can plot both of them after some calculation after, uh, <clears throat> similarly to what was explained before. So single coil require a heavy signal processing, the calculation of those reduced impedance presented before. Um, because the variations in impedance are very small compared to the initial ones. Uh, again, the difference in impedance in air and in contact with the material is huge. The variation of the impedance in contact with the material with a crack or without crack is very small. So to better reveal the defects, instead of um, signal processing to subtract the impedance, you may use not one coil but two coils one in contact with the, both in contact with the material under test, and you can just compare the impedance of the two coils, so that the difference between the two coils will be only uh, depending on the defect. So this is an illustration of an absolute probe. Uh, for example, here, which is a, a, a wounded around a rod, 
And when you will uh, move the probe uh, nearby a crack, you will have a slight change of the uh, signal, which is here, uh, it's not realistic, it is much less than this small increase of the amplitude here. If you make a dual probe, and you can uh, just compare the impedance of the two probes, if you move this differential probe nearby a crack, you will see a signal only when you have a difference between the two probes, one over the crack, one not, and you will have double uh, signal when you, uh, when you move uh, the differential probe nearby the crack. So this is a dual probe uh, system, which is both are based on the eddy current testing, of course, and, and, and will have uh, the same dependence on the material probe properties. So if the coils are really uh, exactly identical, you will have uh, a signal almost only when you will have defects uh, on the material under test. Uh, more recent uh, work tend to replace the secondary coil by a direct measurement of the magnetic properties. It's even uh, more sensitive to the defects. In this case, if you replace the secondary probe by a magnetic field sensor, uh, GMR, squid, and so on, actually you will use the primary probe to generate magnetic field in the material and you will measure it. And when you will be above a crack, you will have changes of the magnetic field. So this looks like eddy current testing in a differential mode. It is actually slightly different physical mechanisms behind. Now for the uh, probe configuration, uh, you will have uh, encircling probes for tubes, like this one. You may have uh, inner probes when you want to inspect uh, the inner side of the tubes, and you can have a differential probe, so receiving a coil, emitting coil here for tubes. When you have plates, you cannot encircle with a copper wire the wall plate, so you need either to put a small coil in the surface, as it was illustrated before, or to have larger, uh, so this is case, it is what we call the pancake coil, due to the shape, of the coil. And if you want to have much larger magnetic field in the material, so a higher response, and to be much less sensitive to the impedance in air, you may use a horseshoe shaped coil. So you take a magnetic yoke, typically made of soft iron, soft magnetic iron, and you will want the wire against uh, around the, the yoke itself, and you will measure the impedance of this coil. And you will have, in this case, a magnetic behavior which will be much more sensitive to the material properties. So this can be used not only to detect cracks, but also as a, a technique to measure qualitatively at least the magnetic properties of the material under test. Now some applications of eddy current testing. Um, of course, it's basically uh, widely used for detection of cracks, cracks decreasing artificially the conductivity, uh, increasing artificially the liftoff to detect the variation of impedance. And this is widely used in aeronautics and nuclear industries. But it may be used as well to make some measurement of the properties as a tool of characterization of the microstructural state absolute probes may be able to estimate the value of the conductivity and the permeability of the material. Um, there exist even uh, analytical solutions of the impedance uh, of the coil under certain uh, configurations. So you may use it as a measurement tool, which is non-invasive, and you don't need to modify the shape of the, of the material under test. Just place a probe and you have local information about connectivity and permeability. And those two parameters are known to be, not, not the connectivity, but the permeability, the magnetic permeability, is sensitive to the heat treatment applied to the material and to the stress level. So from this point, we are moving from cracks to modification of the properties of the material. And to assess the stress level is of primary importance. You know that we use um, internal stresses at the surface to harden the material. And you may want to check that the level you have is consistent with objectives. And 
measuring the probability might be a way to do it. The hardness is also correlated to the response of the eddy currents. When you harden the material by carburization, for example, you will modify uh, the two connectivity and probability, so you, your signal will, will change, so you may use as a control for quality control of the parts that you fabricate. Um, the effect of the liftoff. The liftoff is when you uh, put away the, the probe from the material, and you know that this has a huge effect on the impedance. But you can use it to check the thickness of a coating. Imagine that you have a polymer coating on a metallic part, and you want to detect some variations of the uh, thickness of the coating. You can use a eddy current probe, and the impedance will move, will change if the coating changes of the thickness. So various applications in metallurgy, in production lines, to check the quality of the part at each step of the manufacturing. And some tentative uh, estimation of the residual stresses or internal stresses due to the magnetoelastic coupling in uh, fellow magnetic steel. This is an example of uh, impedance of uh, a decurrent um, globe with a yoke, uh, and to see the effect of the resistance plotted against the uh, stress which is applied, a tensile stress. And there is, um, so the scale here is very large actually, it's moving less than two ohm in total. So less than 10% total variation of the impedance from zero to a 900 megapascal, which should be very, very close to the uh, elastic limit. So this is what we can do with uh, eddy current testing. As all other NDT techniques, eddy current testing is a highly standardized method. And each country or group of countries has a specific uh, standard to do it. For example, the British standards. So I just pick up here some examples of standards, but you have dozens of different standards for the various potential applications of the eddy current testing. For example, this one about a eddy current testing of non fellows tubes, a method for measurement of coating thickness, some American standards, um, in situ electromagnetic examination of non magnetic heat exchanger tubes, and so on. So, the standards are focused on the technique itself precisely and on the application field precisely as well. That's why you have such a huge number of standards for usage of eddy current testing for non destructive testing. Uh, for example, this one connected to the lecture yesterday recommended practice for examination and evaluation of pitting corrosion. There is a standard about it. I should mention, I remember yesterday, uh, Professor Giffey mentioned about the uh, difficulty to put ultrasound uh, probe when the surface is not smooth, when you have corrosion or rust. In the current, you are less sensitive to the quality of the surface. It has to be flat, more or less, but you may have some, uh, some rust, you may be able to make some evaluation. So it is highly uh, adapted to a corrosion monitoring. Uh, European standards as well, and um, two examples, and of course you have some um, uh, similarities between the standards from British, American, uh, European, or Japanese ones, and this is, uh, may pose problems uh, when you have a manufacturing process involving different countries, each one having different standards, you need to, to harmonize the standards or to find a way to um, uh, to ensure the quality of the parts in all the countries where you will fabricate and sell the products. So there are some agreements of equivalence of standards necessary. So the technique itself and its application is standardized or normalized, but you need then to implement a different testing in a given situation. When you do that, you will have operators whose uh, job will be to uh, perform a different testing. The operators will follow the guidelines of the standards, of course, but the operators themselves will be trained to do it and to be able to be ECT operator, a different testing operator, you need that the operator itself, the person doing it, is also given a certificate by independent bodies 
which means outside of the company where the, per the person is working, after appropriate training, and that exists different levels of certification. Uh, in France, CoFriend is doing it, uh, ASNT in US, ISNT in India, GSNDI in Japan, and so on. So the technique is normalized and standardized, and the operator also. And if you ensure that everything is done in a proper way, you can uh, have a certification of the company or the products the, the company is making. From this point, I will move then to some more research work on the electromagnetic techniques, which means that some of the techniques that will be presented from this point do not have such a certification or such a standardization. So you really have to, to, to be careful when you read in scientific papers some good correlation between this defect and the technique. Most of the time, it is not standardized, not yet. It takes heavy time to do it. So eddy current is well standardized. Magnetic measurements, some of the techniques has some things like we call it practice, but it's not a standard. And some techniques are still simply not standardized, meaning that the company may use it, but cannot claim because I use it, my product is safer. So eddy current, um, the penetration depth is at the same time uh, a huge problem and a big advantage. It's a big advantage because if you want to detect surface cracks and you adjust the frequency so that the penetration depth is tip the typical uh, depth of the crack, you will have a huge impact of the crack on the impedance. If you have a low frequency and you have like one centimeter penetration depth, your small cracks of 50 microns will not change significantly the impedance. So the limited penetration depth, it's an advantage intrinsically. But the drawback it is that you cannot detect deep surface uh, defects. And uh, or you may detect subsurface defects. This is possible. So that's an advantage and a uh, drawback. Uh, if you have a defect in the bulk of a material, ultrasounds are much better adapted, of course. Uh, but for with a surface defect, eddy current is more uh, maybe easier to use because you are for ultrasonic testing. You have this uh, near field region, so if you want to detect really surface defects, you would need either to to move away a little bit the sensor or to adjust the analysis of the signals. So um, if you want to get deeper with the eddy current, and some people try to do it you can um, decrease the frequency. This is obvious. If you decrease uh, the, um, the frequency, uh, the penetration depth will be increased. This is one way. And if you do it, you will not only uh, decrease, uh, I mean, increase the penetration depth of the, of the current, but at the same time, you will decrease the impedance. Not the resistance, but the resistance plays no role in the detection. You will, de you will decrease uh, the Im imaginary part of the impedance, that one that is sensitive to the material under test. So by decreasing the frequency, you have a higher penetration depth, but at the same time, you are losing the sensitivity of the sensor. So you may want to increase uh, the signal amplitude to be able to detect tiny changes, or you could use um, <clears throat> pulse eddy current testing. This is um, a sister technique from uh, eddy current testing that consists not of harmonic excitation, but of pulse application, which permits two things. First, a huge amplitude, because you power the coil for a limited period of time, so you can send much higher current before overheating of the coil. And at the same time, you will have not a single harmonic excitation, but a multi-harmonic excitation, like white noise or something that will include low frequency content. There is another way to uh, increase the uh, penetration depth for magnetic materials. Here you have the permeability mu that appear. And uh, you may know that for magnetic materials, when you have a saturation of the magnetic uh, flux density, the permeability decreases. So if you add to the coil, just at the back of the coil, you add uh, bulky magnet, you will saturate, magnetically speaking, the material, 
the permeability drops down and the pitch and depth increases. That's a way also to, to tailor the pitch and depth of the eddy current testing. But let's go back to the pulse eddy current testing, PECT. This is one, 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 one example. Um, by using uh, conventional ECT, you have a single frequency ex excitation. You may use multi frequency ECT, that's a possibility. And you can analyze separately the each component uh, data to, to reveal uh, the flows. If you use a pulsed ECT, you will use more like a square shaped signals here of a given duration. So this is not in seconds, it's much less, it is normalized time. So that the frequency content is more rich. You have uh, a large a low frequency component and several a, a peaks of a amplitude versus a frequency. So if you do that, you can um, reach more information about the connectivity and permeability of the material under test. You can assess the thickness of insulation and coating and you can evaluate the sickness and current state and detect a defect. So you may see it as a more rich information uh, because you have more frequency that is applied. One, one example of a detection of the pipe wall thinning determination using pulsed eddy current testing by analyzing the uh, peaks of a signal when the current is, uh, uh, is a put on or off by analyzing the frequency peaks um, of the signal here, you are able to uh, assess uh, when you go nearby a zone where you have a wall thinning of the material, you will have an extra signal in this range. And these are some correlations that were given of the um, depth of the thickness uh, of the pipe versus the true depth and with uh, quite good and reasonable agreement between both using the pulsed ECT. So in this case, uh, really the multi-frequency uh, content is important to be able to feel the thickness of the material underneath. So previously, um, it was um, the eddy current testing uh, impedance analysis was mostly adapted to uh, aluminum, which is a huge uh, branch of application. Now, if you move to fellow magnetic material, you have some other uh, important points to consider. Going back to the explanation about the decurrent probe uh, effect, when you um, put the probe in contact with a conductive material, a decurrent create a counter magnetic uh, flux in the coil. So you decrease the inductance and you uh, increase the resistance. If you now move from aluminum to uh, steel or a fellow magnetic material, the same will occur, of course, but in addition to it, the material itself will generate much stronger magnetic flux that will also be added to the previous one. So in the case you um, move a probe from air to a fellow magnetic material, the inductance will not decrease. On the contrary, it will increase. It tends to decrease due to the eddy current, but tends to increase due to the magnetic permeability of the material. So in the uh, reduced imaginary part of the coil impedance versus the uh, reduced real part of the uh, coil impedance, you start from the point in air here, P0, and <clears throat> you will move, uh, when you put the probe in contact with the material under test, you will move against, uh, along the dotted uh, lift off line here. So in um, non ferromagnetic material, you will move down, and on ferromagnetic, you will move up. But if you, then if you have um, a crack, uh, you will have actually, hopefully, a very similar effect, an increase of the imaginary part and a decrease of the real part. This is due to the fact that when you have a crack, more or less you are reducing the apparent connectivity and permeability. So both effects tend to move the impedance in the same direction than for non philomagnetic materials. 
But actually, if you take a philobiotic material, um, you will have a permeability that will play a significant role here. Permeability of steel ranges from uh, relatively to the vacuum permeability. It will range from 50 to 5,000, depending on the materials. So you may divide the penetration depth by one or two decades quite easily if you move from aluminum to philomagnetic steel. So as mentioned before, you can add a strong magnet behind the coil to uh, saturate magnetically the material and then to have mu that goes back close to mu zero, the so vacuum one, and to have much higher a uh, distance of eddy current in the material. So this is fellow magnetic materials considered as a material under test for eddy current testing. But fellow magnetic materials have more properties that can be used. And from this point, we are moving away from the industrial techniques, but more from research techniques. A fellow magnetic material exhibits a very specific magnetic behavior, uh, magnetic induction B or magnetization M, depending on your notation. And one typical uh, response of the material, it is a hysteresis loop, the magnetization protein versus the uh, excitation field H. And uh, this uh, hysteresis cycle involves numerous different category of magnetic phenomena in the material, uh, the structure in domains of magnetic domains, the response of the domain walls to an excitation, and also the ability of the dipole moments to rotate or to move uh, as a result of an excitation. And all of these mechanisms are sensitive to the changes of the microstructure. It's even too sensitive so that it is very difficult to separate each effect. But basically, uh, one a quite straightforward uh, impact, it is the effect of mechanical stress. All philomagnetic materials are magnetostructive. Um, maybe I could mention that the um, very first ultrasonic transducers were made of magnetostructive materials before the discovery of the piezoelectric effect in ceramics by the Curie brothers. Uh, steel uh, deforms as a result of a magnetic field. This is the reason why electrical transformers make noise. And if you consider here the reverse effect, when you apply a mechanical stress, you modify the magnetic response in this way. So this is an example of a low carbon steel and for a high carbon steel, the hysteresis loop is different as a point of stress. You may want to measure the level of residual stresses in the material. Why not measuring the hysteresis loop and analyze the data? This is where we reach the very first problem of the magnetic-based techniques, which is that there is um, standards to measure a hysteresis loop. Uh, not so many exist, but the standard it's, um, for example, <clears throat> it's uh, on the geometry of the material under test, <coughs> which is called Epstein frames. So you make an assembly of the materials to be tested of plates with constraints on the width and thickness. And from this assembly, you will be able to reduce or to cancel completely the eddy current in the material. Not that of the current testing, but eddy currents occurring in every magnetic material sub subjected to a harmonic excitation. So you make a, a lamination structure, and this is a, one example of uh, the geometry. So you need a large number of plates, hopefully identical to each other, and you will, from this assembly, be able, by adding the coils in the system, to measure in a proper way the magnetic properties. This induces constraints on the material in terms of shape. It cannot be used for non-destructive testing because you will not cut your material to be tested. Another method to measure the magnetic properties is to use a vibrating sample magnetometer, which is highly uh, precise. And to this, you need to make, um, uh, you make, um, a magnetic uh, static field with some external uh, coil system in York, and you make uh, an oscillation of the sample inside so that you will measure the small variations of the magnetic field in a, in a coil. 
So you can either vibrate the sample or vibrate the coil itself. Uh, this measure is uh, an absolute measurement of the, of the magnetization of the material. That's really nice, but you need a very small sample, a few millimeters size. Again, this is not adapted for NDT. You will not cut your parts in small grains to make this measure. Apart from those standards, there is no real uh, accepted standard for measuring the magnetic properties. And this is where we reach uh, the difficulty of a, the normalization or standardization of the magnetic-based uh, techniques. So, <clears throat> but still we can do some tests and, and, and we can work on that and, and try to find the um, uh, possibilities uh, of this. So using a magnetic yoke like this one, you are able to induce rather uh, large excitation field in the material by measuring um, the voltage of a coil wounded around the yoke, you are able to assess the flux variations, which in turn gives you the flux density. So with a, a small a sensor like this, you are able to have a measurement of the BH curve, like the flux density versus excitation field. It's not a standardized one, but still you can have information. So in a, a horseshoe configuration like this, um, you, have, you need a good contact between the yoke and the material under test, so it has to be flat. And the basic operation consists of supplying low frequency current to the primary coil and to measure the tangential excitation field using a whole sensor nearby. So you know that the magnetic field H, uh, the tangential component is continuous when you have an interface, which means if you measure H nearby the plate, you may consider that it is the same inside the plate. The B field is not continuous. <clears throat> a secondary coil to measure my magnetic, my, the, my, the magnetic field um, variations. And from the literature, you may find several work um, to use the BH curves, the hysteresis loops, as an indicator of the residual stresses, clip damage, or phase transitions. <clears throat> but you can do even more. The difficulty of the BH curve it is that it the results from various phenomena and the effect of a targeted uh, variation in the material could be uh, the, precip the precipitations inside could be a change in phase will be hardly uh, seen on the BH curve. So we, we we need to go deeper in the technique itself to have the magnetic mechanisms that would be more sensitive to a targeted defect. For example, um, yeah, the uh, history loop result from the averaging of all the all domains, and the depends on the weekly on the microstructure. But we can add to the same system not only a measure of the pH, but you may add an ECT probe just nearby the material. So the ECT probe, the eddy current testing probe is sensitive to the conductivity, which is considered usually as being independent on the uh, microstructure properties and depend on the permeability. But the permeability itself is a function of the, of the magnetic status of the material. So by combining a measurement of the uh, BH curve, adding a static or low frequency excitation field in the material, you are able to monitor the impedance of the coil, which is sensitive to the permeability, and you can plot it against the excitation. This is what we call the magnetic incremental permeability, which more or less, uh, if you have the BH curve of the material, and you apply a static excitation in the magnetic yoke heat, so a constant current. If you do so, you will reach a given point of the hysteresis loop, and the eddy current probe is supplied by voltage, which will add a tiny excitation field of, of a high frequency to the material under test. Magnetic, um, for the magnetic behavior, you will have slight variations around a given point. This is what we call it uh, a measure of the incremental permeability. 
Of course, the impedance of the coil is not the probability. It is just linked to, and the correlations that were uh, proposed in the literature uh, ensure that the link is not proportional, but we can calculate back the probability if we wish. So the excitation field is varied enough to saturate the material, so to have the full uh, BH curve of the magnetic uh, material under test. The transmitter coil or ECT probe is supplied with a high frequency. The receiver coil voltage is measured, and this is closely linked with the conductivity and probability. And you will cross all the hysteresis. And depending on the points, it happens that when the magnetic field is, uh, flux density is reversed, so when you reach the coercivity of the material, you usually observe a maximum in the uh, probability of the material. So the uh, magnetic incremental probability signal will also get through a maximum here. When you, have, when you are at the saturation of the magnetic field loop, the probability tends to be lowered down to zero, down to mu zero, and then the signal of the ECT probe will tend to decrease as well. So this gives you not only a measure or an, an image of the uh, impedance uh, of the probability, but it gives you it as a, as a function of the excitation field H, which, which represents a much higher and rich information. <clears throat> so we replace actually a single measurement point done by eddy current testing by a full curve, and we may then analyze all characteristics of this curve uh, the distance between the two, uh, the two points here, uh, the difference between the saturation zone to the maximum one, and so on. So you, you may define several indicators based on that, and then to have a look to its variation or correlation with several uh, defects or uh, changes in the microstructure of the material. Getting back to writing of the impedance of the coil, it is the same equation as before, just now, L1, R, E, and I, M, that are the uh, properties of the matter under test, all of them becomes to be dependent on the static excitation field HTC. This is how we reach a full curve. <clears throat> One example of a application of it, um, so we similar a horseshoe shape uh, the, for excitation field here. We, we are able to uh, assess, for example, the level of plastic strain in this case. Uh, which have a huge impact on the magnetic properties. So the technique, uh, if you take a single point here of impedance, you will observe a, uh, a decrease with the plastic strain level, but plotting the wall curve here, you have more rich information. Uh, I'd like you to have a look to the uh, amplitude here of the impedance. For one curve, you are moving from 77.4 ohm, getting down to 77.2. 0.2 compared to 77, it's much less than 0.5%. This is a typical variations of impedance that we are detecting here. And depending on the different plots, you can reveal uh, the effect of, plastic, of the plastic strain on the uh, behavior uh, measured here. So you may think by measuring the impedance, analyzing, and maybe I can predict the plastic strain level. Another example of usage of this measurement is to try to detect um, the level of a degradation of clip damaged high chrome steel. It was a work done a couple of years ago. And the idea of clip damage, so the clip is when you apply a high stress over a long period of time and you, at a given temperature, you observe a continuous increase of the strain level until it reaches uh, the rupture in the tertiary uh, zone here. So when you reach uh, this uh, stage, you have cracks as, uh, to be detected by other techniques. But when you see the cracks, it's already late. So you, the time before replacement might be problematic if you wait to see the cracks. But before you can detect the, the cracking in the secondary zone, you have some void apparition in the material, and you have changes of the microstructure. And one idea was to say, OK, let's do not wait the crack separation, but let's do things much earlier. And some properties are dependent on a, the secondary state. If you take the uh, hardness, it is not very dependent on the status of creep. 
but if you take some other uh, macrostructural parameters, uh, that the, uh, like this one, which is really linked to the grain misorientation, it, it is increasing already in this uh, secondary uh, region. What about now some magnetic techniques to measure what is happening in this range? So a work was done by the same magnetic incremental probability to uh, detect the creep damage, and the uh, samples were subjected to various stress and temperature heat treatments for large uh, stress, time, and temperature. And then, uh, after those uh, heat treatment, the samples were uh, taken back, and the measurement was done when the material was at rest room temperature and no stress uh, applied to it. And MIP signals, so this MAMA, the magnetic incremental probability that may be seen also that eddy current testing under a given excitation uh, field uh, showed a, a large dependence on the heat treatment. So the correlation between the heat treatment and the MIP signals showed some tendencies in terms of, for example, the number of precipitates that were measured by another means. So this is one tentative application of the uh, technique to detect the change of the status of the material before the apparition of defects. But dealing with magnetic behavior, there is one important feature which is used for quality control, which is the Backhausen noise. Um, for a magnetic material, a fellow magnetic material, if you increase the magnetic excitation field slowly in time, like this one, like a ramp, uh, you will observe an increase of the flux density, of course, and you can build the hysteresis loop with it. But actually, if you go very slowly, and if you monitor the voltage of the measurement coil, you will notice a noise in it. It is not a measurement noise. It is a noise induced by the domain wall uh, configuration change, which is more or less avalanche of domain that changes of the directions like this. When you increase uh, the magnetic field, the domains will change of size and it's done like avalanches, which will give some given noise. The former experiments of Backhausen itself was to directly connect the coil here to a loudspeaker and there was some noise on it because the loudspeaker filtered spontaneously the low frequency content, so you reached already the high frequency content of the noise and make noise in the, in the system. The noise properties, it's uh, very attractive because it depends only on the domain avalanche uh, phenomenon. It do not depend on the conductivity, electrical conductivity. It do not depend on the domain wall bulging, the capability of it to vibrate. It depends only on a single magnetic feature. So the correlations might be better uh, to several defects and so to measure the back of the noise, you simply need to uh, have a slowly varying magnetic field and to monitor the noise with some coils, uh, sensors. Uh, as an example, uh, from this noise, you are able to trigger uh, the noise level after some filtering. The noise is uh, especially large when you reach the coercivity of the material. Of course, because this is when you will have the largest amount of changes of the, of the, of the domains. And by some a reconstruction of the noise, by, uh, the, you put it square, we said we integrate it over time. And if you do that, you are able to rebuild something that looks like a hysteresis loop that was called uh, magnetic background noise energy. And that uh, reveals especially the coercivity of the material. That's a way to measure the coercivity without uh, following the standards of magnetic hysteresis loops uh, measurement. And this, for example, the back of the noise is known to be typically uh, highly sensitive to mechanical stress. This is one example of application um, of the noise. Um, you have the hysteresis loop, which are uh, plotted against the heat treatment. So we have huge changes. Another example, it is the effect of unitary stress on back of the noise. So the magnetic signals are recorded for static stress level at different angles. And this was the experiment uh, of, of this work uh, cited here. The stress, the unitary stress is applied, but the system here uh, may be rotated. And actually, it is uh, noticed that um, when you are 
aligned with the stress, you have uh, an ABM energy that is much larger, and when you reach a direction which is perpendicular to the stress application, you have a much lower signal. So this shows the high sensitivity of the back horizon noise to the mechanical stress. And that's why one of the main companies working on that uh, named Stress Tech to measure the back of the noise. So this is uh, a commercial product of a back of the noise um, application, which is proposed to uh, evaluate the, the internal stresses, uh, like cold working processes, that um, you want to monitor the quality of short pinning, for example, the techniques that helps to uh, increase the internal stress at the surface to prevent against the, the rupture. Uh, back of the noise is also sensitive to uh, the hardness that you may uh, increase by several means, including the uh, carburization. And you can also detect a surface defects, uh, defects uh, given by green cleaning burn or a local discoloration of the surface. And I'm reaching almost the end of my, uh, of my lecture um, by one equipment uh, that gathers all techniques, um, um, back of the noise, a incremental permeability, electron testing, harmonic analysis, and so on. And the idea of this uh, example, of, of this equipment, is to gather all information and from these numerous indicators to find correlations with a target uh, flow detection or property of the material. Uh, so it combines all of them. So this is, um, I think uh, that the uh, research on this is still continuing to better understand why this or this indicator should be dependent or should be sensitive to this or this defect. I will, which now I will uh, summarize uh, in this last slide. Uh, for NDT, dozens of techniques exist. Some of them benefit from standardization. All the last things I presented, including back of the noise, do not have standards as well defined as ultrasonic testing, endocrine testing, and so on. There are techniques that can be used as quality control, but do not help for a certification. Um, the techniques of non-destructive testing uh, are limited only by the uh, imagination of scientists, which is huge. Uh, the main limit is, is the practical implementation and validation. Um, some years ago, I remember a conference by a specialist uh, of it, and he said that they do not have time enough to try and to implement all the ideas proposed by academic research about NDT. Uh, it takes time, it was mentioned uh, yesterday also, that for um, the qualification requires a huge time, much even larger than for uh, medical applications because you are talking about safety. So you need to make sure that it is reproducible, that the operator will be able to understand uh, the signals that are observed and so on. Uh, to the, the, the two main um, issues or trends nowadays about NDT, it's a, the fact that we are using uh, increasingly, uh, increasingly uh, polymer composite or non-conductive materials, which means that eddy current testing simply do not work. And we have a defect that are not completely understood, so this is uh, a field of research and industrial implementation. And the second thing that requires additional um, work, it is the additive, uh, additive manufacturing parts, um, because um, when the part is completed, of course, it is of complex shape. It is the objective of the additive manufacturing of metals. And when you have this complex shape, you cannot inspect inside the shape. So you need to find ways to inspect during the fabrication process. This is one thing. And also, the nature of defects are not known yet. When you make uh, some forging, some casting, we know typically what, what may happen as problems, and we may uh, find techniques to detect it. But for uh, additive manufactured parts, it is not the case. And for the adequate testing, um, as a summary, that's a technique which is especially sensitive to surface cracks, and this is how it is uh, mostly used, 
It may give additional information when it is uh, coupled with magnetic properties measurement. It is not an image of uh, a given surface on the area of testing material. It is a local measurement, but you can make a mechanical scan, so mechanically displacing the probe to make an image of a given surface and to detect flaws or cracks. And um, so for crack detection, it is well uh, implemented. For correlation with microstructural properties, we are at a much lower level. And that's it for my lecture. Thanks for attention. <laughs>